next we'll be foraying into the world of planes, trains and bicycles to examine the future of mobility. Please welcome to the stage Charles Ross of The Economist and his panellists. Thank you very much. Excellent. Good afternoon, everybody. Panelists, please, please come this way. Um, as mentioned, we do have representatives from, from planes, trains, and <coughs> bicycles. Um, we have Bernard Long from Airbus. Welcome, Bernard. We have Alan Jang from OFO. Welcome, Alan. Oh, my we have Michelle Tan <laughs> from Mobil Mobility X and SMRT. And last but not least, we have George Wang from Singapore Airlines. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to carry on the discussion of mobility here, which was started earlier this morning. Uh, there was gr some great presentations from, uh, um, from AirAsia, from Grab. The Prince was also talking about mo mobility as a core to his, um, his startup program. Now. We're going to talk about some of the, the, the sexier side, I think, of, of mobility, if I may. For the eagle eyes of you, you'll <coughs> notice that there is no representation from autonomous vehicles up here. They get a lot of press. People talk a lot about them. We're going to talk to, about other parts of that mobility ecosystem. So let's start just by exploring the sort of things which, which excites you. You all have great jobs thinking about what the future of mobility is going to look like. What excites you about the future? What really interesting initiatives are you talking about? Michelle, maybe we can start with you. Oh, it's always ladies first. Ladies okay. first, of course. <laughs> um, as a startup, and I'm sure not all of you are familiar with Mobility X, uh, we're actually fully funded by SMRT. <coughs> it's a startup, it's five months old, and it's entirely focused on mobility as a service. Uh, it's an app integration product. So there are two key things that we're really excited about and we've launched in the last uh, couple of months, for one. It's the uh, Mobility as a Service solution. This is an integrated app that looks at uh, putting together multiple transportation modes. You have you know, things like your on-demand shuttle, public transportation, uh, dockless bicycles, uh, e-scooters, and uh, e-bicycles as well, all on one app. And it allows people to uh, pre-book uh, the mobility modes, uh, pay for the journeys all in one single integrated app. So we have uh, you know, nicely called it Jalan uh, Jalan. I'm actually wearing the t-shirt now. Um, for those who are you know, not from Singapore, Jalan Jalan, Jalan in essence means uh, you know, to walk in Malay or in Singlish. And Jalan Jalan really just means you know, the art of moving, uh, enjoying the whole process of moving. So to Mobility X, Jalan Jalan really just means that we're going to take the hassle out of transportation for all of you. Um, the second product that we're really focusing on and extremely excited about is called Kaki, K-A-K-I. Again, it follows on this whole Singlish uh, naming of our products. Kaki in Malay means uh, a buddy, a good friend, and we want Kaki to be your transportation buddy. Uh, what Kaki is, is a single integrated uh, payment wallet for multiple transport modes, including public transportation, as well as your last mile uh, mobility devices, including your dockless bicycles, e-scooters, and e-vehicles. So this is beta tested. So what this means is for the first time in Singapore and in Asia, you do have a select group of people that can actually use a single mobile wallet on a monthly subscription basis uh, to then book and go on public transportation as well as take multiple mobility modes. I would certainly support the, um, the development of a platform which integrates all of these mobility solutions because it it's pretty hard to navigate all of that. And we were just talking um, about a platform which could potentially um, aggregate all of the bike sharing apps here in Singapore and whether that's actually a, a fe something feasible which is going to happen in the future. Do you think so? Would OFO sign up to something like that? It's a very, uh, very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think for uh, you know for Ofo, I th we're you know, very very excited about the potential of bike share itself. Um, it's a it's a model that definitely is very new. Uh, has only come out uh, less than three years ago in China, and I think a lot of people kind of see China as an obvious success story because people in China bike so much, um, and you know it's very easy to see people shifting from using a private bicycle into using a shared bicycle. Um, we're actually very excited about the progress we're seeing in our entire international business. Um, Singapore, one of the stories I like to tell um, is our founders, when they were looking to expand internationally, Singapore was the first country they came to. Um, and what they did was they sat on the side of the street uh, at a cafe uh, for a few hours, counting the number of bicycles that rode by. And I think they counted three bicycles. Um, so 
nevertheless, not a very inauspicious, a very inauspicious <laughs> start, I think, for bicycle sharing. If, if, you know, if we think that the bicycle sharing market is a replacement of private bikes, then that's, that's definitely not a very exciting market. <laughs> um, but, you know, anyways, we, we came and tried it, and we actually saw that it was much more than that. Um, so I have, uh, you know, personally a lot of friends who previously never rode bikes, yep. and today they started riding bicycles um, because bike sharing made that available. So I think what we're seeing is in transport, you know, people really will use a service as long as it's cheap and it's convenient. Um, so that's really what we're focused on. And you know, whether people have previously ridden bicycles or not, um, they're open to trying it. And in fact, there's nothing more convenient than uh, you know, a form of transport that's at your door. You know, no matter how fast Uber or Grab gets you that car, if it's 10 minutes or two minutes, it's not as fast as the bike that's in front of you. Um, and so for us, we really focus a lot on how do we make sure that people can stay mobile? How do we make sure that you know, wherever you want to pick up a bike, the bike is there. Um, and how do we keep the bikes flowing around the system very well? So when a user is using a bike, when they are thinking about ending the trip, where can they end a trip such that the next user can easily pick it up? Um, so there's a lot of analytics, a lot of data that goes into it. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. This uh, adoption, I mean, you've changed, you've changed the culture of people in <coughs> Singapore then. If, you're, if you've got a lot more bikes on the road, a lot more people cycling. I guess helping to change that culture is working closer with urban planners, getting more bike lanes in Singapore and more places to park your bikes, these sorts of things. That must be a big part of your role as well, that sort of working with local urban planners and the regulators. Absolutely. So I think there's, uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of infrastructure mm. that can also affect the usage of the bicycles. Um, and definitely with more bicycle-friendly infrastructure that can also increase usage. Um, one of the, uh, I think, very exciting stats uh, from, that we're seeing from China um, is before bicycle sharing existed, actually 5.6% of trips in the city were happening on bikes. Um, whether that's walking, cars, or public transit, 5.6% um, of them were actually on bicycles, and this is basically private bikes. Um, after shared bikes came out, actually 11.5% of trips in the country are happening on bikes. So it's a much bigger amount of people that are biking now that shared bikes exist um, versus private bikes. And I think in Singapore, we're seeing very similar, uh, similar numbers. Um, so we don't have the exact numbers, but I think the amount of people riding bikes today is much more than before. Excellent. Good to hear. I am a cyclist, so I'm, a, I'm very positive about this as well. <laughs> um, let's talk about something just as sexy as bikes. UAVs. Ah. Um, if we talk about mobility solutions, everyone talks about drones in the future and the role they'll play in either delivering our goods or, um, or, p or potentially sort of individual manned drones which can take me to, to work and back every day. Give us a bit more insight into what Airbus is doing in this space. Yeah, so I'm Vernon, I'm from Airbus, and I think most of you here would know about our commercial aircraft, the A380, the A350 with my client here, Singapore Airlines. But I think um, in the drone space, it's pre getting pretty interesting. And uh, what, what it really keeps me up at night at the moment is uh, there are two parts. One is the ability to um, using bits to shift atoms. That means meaning that we are going to automate the way how drones can do delivery, cargo delivery. I'm not talking about the small delivery like 3 to 5 kg e-commerce logistics. I'm talking about the 10 to 100 kg in that space. There, there is, there's this whole white space of that you can actually do medical cargo delivery. You can actually send supplies uh, that, that may take nine hours. If you, if, you, if you, I mean, in Singapore, everywhere is a road. But when you think of Indonesia, you take a car, you just drive nine hours, where you can just fly a straight line, which is an hour. So drones has this uh, propensity to be able to help in terms of uh, solving some of the most uh, interesting uh, problems uh, in the space. And the other part that makes it very exciting is the combination of data acquisition and analytics. So uh, one of my, in my portfolio is to look at, uh, is to work with com uh, farming companies, uh, oil and gas mining, real estate companies to combine satellite imaging and drone imaging to help businesses to have actionable insights. And this, this particular initiative we did was actually a startup within Airbus uh, starting from Atlanta, Georgia called Arrow. And, and now we are actually blitzscaling the initiative across Asia Pacific. Interesting, and I know, of course, we've got Airbus and Singapore Airlines sitting next to each other here. You guys collaborate a lot, work together. Um, part of that collaboration is around developing new great airlines for us to sit on. But what, what else is going on with Singapore Airlines in terms of the, the, the future of mobility? Where can you see the, the benefits for, well, both for goods, but also for, for us as passengers in the future? 
So uh, we have launched 350, uh, and uh, in October, we're going to launch, the, again, the world's longest flight. Uh, so Singapore, New York, direct, uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, Airbus, uh, the, the new model, the UAR ultra long range model. So that's exciting. So that cut down the travel hours, and uh, you can fly from Singapore to New York in under 19 hours. So um, for Singapore Airlines, on the other hand, on the Singapore Airlines, what we are looking at is really uh, digitizing uh, you know, the whole company, uh, the core business, as well as looking at you know, the adjacent business. So in digitizing the core business, we are looking at um, changing the way we sell, changing the way we serve our customer, the way we operate, and uh, the way uh, we enable our employees. So just to give you an example, uh, we, uh, last year we had rolled out uh, an app for our pilots, which enabled them to prepare all their trips at home, and uh, they can go straight from home to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the boarding gate without the need to go to the control, uh, so-called control centers. So gone are the images, you see the, uh, our pilots to carry a big suitcase full of documents, all their flight plans, the weather information, whatever uh, their schedules, their training schedule, whatever you require for them uh, will be already uh, in the app. Um, the other thing we're going to launch, I think we have an announcing uh, uh, in February about our crisp pay. So that is, uh, uh, a way to enable our loyal customers, uh, our Chris Flyer members, to spend their points in the retail outlets uh, using a, a mobile payment. So we're going to launch in the next few weeks our Chris Pay. Okay, interesting. And I am glad that you mentioned pilots because that leads very well onto my next question. We were discussing earlier before we came on stage that um, apparently it's a very poorly kept secret that um, the planes don't need pilots <laughs> anymore. Um, we don't need them to fly these planes. I mean, we see them now on the MRT here in Singapore. In fact, my, um, my niece and nephew were over here a couple of weeks ago and they got really excited because they could get on the train, run to the very front of the train, look out the window, pretend they were the driver because there was no driver because it's all automated here. Very excited about that. But they were not scared by this. They, uh, you know, this, this was normal to them, this is fine. I trust that, uh, you know, that, uh, that this can be automated and I trust the system behind this, but I can't imagine my parents, for example, being that comfortable with that. So I think there's a, you know, like anything, there's a, there's a cultural challenge around adoption of new mobility solutions, whether it's driverless trains, driverless planes, etc. So we'll talk about that from an, an SMRT sort of perspective. Did you, um, any, any learnings from that? Any, how, do you, how do you deal with that in terms of dealing with, with the customer, the passenger? Um, so I will not comment on the SMRT side. Okay. I would, you know, these days we are always hoping for positive news coming from SMRT. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's fully funded by, uh, Mobility X is fully funded by SMRT, but that's it, we're actually tapping on the parent company as and when, you know, uh, in terms of its core competencies as well as its skills. But to answer your question, uh, to us, you know, transportation is very close to everybody's hearts. Um, and if you observe, you know, the experiences so far from the ride-sharing companies, the AV companies, even the bicycle-sharing companies, to me, it boils down to two things. Uh, one is convenience and affordability. Two, it's, uh, one is convenience and, uh, you know, the accessibility of it. Two is affordability. And because it's cl so close to everybody's heart, it becomes a habit, right? You know, whether you take a, you know, fixed route to work um, and the mode that you use. So to you, to any consumer, for them to make that switch, whether it's an AV, whether it's a new technology or a new service, you have to be very clear that this has to be a really good product, one that is affordable, accessible, convenient, I would even say simple, as well as fun to use. And this is very, the very reason why MobilityX is so interested in this space. And to us, the mission has always been, how do you create a hassle-free, seamless transportation experience for all commuters? I wouldn't say for sea and for air for now, we'll just focus on land and make sure that we do a good job out of it. We see these cultural differences probably with, with across all of your businesses, and I'm I'm thinking about bike sharing here for for a second. I'm I'm originally from Melbourne, and it sort of it dismays me a little bit when I see pictures of bikes up in trees and in the Yarra River in central Melbourne. Thinking, you know, I would not see that here in Singapore, and I I think I haven't haven't really seen that. You see it occasionally, but not too much. But much much worse in in Australia. So you got to think. When you're looking at different markets, um, you obviously you have to adapt your business model for those different markets, for the way um, the consumers are going to be operating with your with your product. Can you talk a little bit about um, Ofo's strategy in that sense? Sure, um, that's a very interesting uh, question as well. And I, I think actually 
Um, I think there's a lot of Singaporeans in this room, so I'm sure a lot of you have seen ofos on trees in the <laughs> and, and rivers in Singapore as well. <laughs> um, so I, I think you know, in every country we go to, there's yeah. going to be uh, you know different type of challenges um, and a lot of very similar type of challenges. Um, one of the things that we do in every place we go to, though, is we want to make sure that we're you know responsible operators in every country. Um, and when we go there, you know, if the we have to try our best uh, to make sure that whenever these uh, incidents happen, that we have to take care of it. And there's also a user education piece, which is you know please treat our property uh, you know nicely and respectfully. Um, but you know to that to the extent uh, you know we actually have a very large operations team uh, on the ground every day. Uh, so we actually have over 200 bike marshals in Singapore, for example. Um, and many, many trucks uh, that are responsible for going around, shifting bikes around, collecting uh, bikes that are broken, bringing it back to the warehouse, repairing them, um, also moving bikes from low demand areas to high demand areas. So it's actually a very operationally intensive business. Um, and every country we go to, we want to make sure we are being very responsible uh, when we do that. Interesting. Um, I'm going to shift tack a little bit now. So obviously you're all innovators in your own industry in some way or another, but you can't just innovate on your own. You need partners, you need to be able to collaborate with others. Obviously Singapore Airlines, Airbus, nice example of collaboration here as well. But maybe just if you just talk a little bit about some of, some of your initiatives and how you work with others, how you collaborate, how you build an ecosystem around some of your new solutions and your, your new offerings. I'm thinking about the Singapore Airlines, your new um, innovation lab that you sure. have. And, Tell us a little bit more about how that operates. Uh, Charles, you're exactly right. Um, we can no longer just rely on our uh, traditional way of innovate, mostly the inward looking, depend on our own people, the usual partners. So uh, we have been working with uh, our partners and the look at basically to bring our business problem out and to bring the technology in. So what we mean by that is how do we bring our business problem to the market um, for open innovation. So we create an open innovation ecosystem. We work with NUS Enterprise, we work with uh, the different accelerators, we work with startups and the research institutes. So you have a spectrum of problems uh, for business uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. So there may be immediate problems, there may be problems you want to solve two to five years. And uh, so you work with research institutes for longer problem, we work with startups and, uh, and accelerators for shorter problems. So what we try to do is to leverage on an open innovation uh, uh, ecosystem to solving the business problem. At the same time, to bring the innovative solutions from the technology companies, from the startups, uh, to the uh, uh, internal business. So they curate the, pro uh, the, the technology the business for the adoption. Okay. Um, I can see this being a big problem in terms of, or a big challenge, if you like, for UAVs mm -hmm. as well. I mean, a really a nascent industry um, for it to work Properly, you need so many different partners, a whole ecosystem to develop to make this work, whether it's the movement of goods, whether it's the movement of people. Um, you need all of that to pull all of that together. So how do you, how do you work? I mean, you're the, you're, you, you make the, the equipment, if you like, um, but how do you work with others to get everything else in place? I think in specifically, the question is, how do you build the partnerships out? So I think well, how Airbus thinks about um, the things that we cannot do everything, we probably need partners. So for example, in the cargo delivery space, we work with logistics players to figure out a few things. I think one of the most well-known partnership in Singapore is the our Airbus helicopters work we're called Project Skyways, where it's with uh, Singapore Post, where they actually do drones and parcel locker delivery. And what is interesting in that whole uh, partnership is that actually it helps Airbus to actually further improve uh, what is called the unmanned traffic management, which is actually this core piece of what most uh, UAVs are needing, the, the operating system behind that. It helps us to figure the urban logistics rules. And we didn't limit to that. For example, for our UAV, we actually do, are doing some projects in Rwanda, where we work with the Rwanda government to actually help them to think about how do we regulate the different airspace. Now, to sort of help the audience to think about this, um, every day there are about 200 flights from Changi Airport. There's a ground control tower. There's someone who can organize the flights to come into Changi Airport. With drones, you're taking this by two orders of magnitude. 
and people in China are now talking about having 4,000 drones. So you have to think of 4,000 things flying at the same time and you have to deal with those traffic. So um, it's a combination. You probably will have to work with people who are very good with AI and then we try to blend in our expertise with dealing with regulators, how with uh, Airbus values of security, reliability and safety uh, that we still need to do whether we're doing a commercial plane or whether we're doing a UAV. <coughs> Yeah. That, that is interesting. And you were telling me a little bit earlier, though, um, that the challenge might be additionally complex if you um, if some of those drones are, are cars and then they are drones. Yeah, that's right. So uh, this is a very interesting project that we have. Um, I don't know how many of you heard of the pop-up initiative. So it's a project that we did with Audi. So you have a port that can actually, we have, it's actually under our urban air mobility initiative. So you have this flying, um, sort of hover thing that would magnetically latch onto this port and it flies out and it lands, it goes onto a car wheels and we just announced this partnership with Audi to actually build one. And the clear challenge here is that there are rules governing the land transportation and there are also rules governing the air transportation but the interface of those two worlds is going to be a very big challenge uh, with regulators and I think part of it is also that um, there are two challenges that regulators face. One is safety. The second piece is that we are moving from a human-centric, deterministic way of ensuring safety to an AI probabilistic way of that. And philosophically, it's very difficult to actually build regulations on there. And I think this is where uh, more data is required. We constantly work with regulators, uh, whether in drones um, or even in this kind of initiatives, where we need to give them data to help them to think through how they can regulate the, the industry as a whole. Uh, data is a common term which has been coming out from all of you, that um, more data, more information is going to help all of your businesses operate efficiently. But then, of course, to, to be most efficient at a, at a city or an urban level, then you need to bring all of the sort of mobility solutions together. And I was, um, I was talking to somebody about a, a month ago who who is who's tasked with trying to commercialize the quantum computing um, solutions out of Australia. I mean, obviously, very nascent, um, doesn't exist yet, but a lot of research is going into that. But when I was talking to him, he said that we do not have enough processing power to be able to manage a city and all of these different elements. We don't have enough processing power. Quantum computing is the solution for that. It's the only way we're going to be able to manage all of these different types of mobility through together. That, and it, I see that as a massive challenge for, this, for, the, for us to be able to get the full value out of this and see these, these really efficient cities in the future. Does anybody disagree with me that that is, that is the biggest challenge out there or there are other greater challenges? Um, I, let me answer the question in a very nuanced way. What I actually worked with, prior to joining Airbus, I was also working on self-driving cars. The way I think about drones is that the aviation problem is already solved. We have the planes flying, you know, safety as well. So the problem with drones is about the question of cybersecurity and network. The same with self-driving cars. The self-driving cars is not about driving. Driving is already solved. What needs to be solved is the network latency. If I were to tell you today, the data that you need to receive in order for human reaction is about one millisecond, but the current networks, even with 5G, is 10 mil one order of magnitude away. So what, what happens then? So the people are looking for different new solutions, like maybe quantum computing to yep. actually um, improve that. And the other part is also to do edge computing where they actually allow to reduce the speed, fix the file format, so that the data that went for, for us to go into autonomous world, they will be far more reliable. And the questions of latency and cybersecurity is the key issues that we need to address uh, today, whether it's today or whether it's for tomorrow. Would you agree with that, Michelle? I uh, agree. And I would truly say that, you know, um, when it comes to this sector, it's beyond just technology. Uh, it's really around the regulations as well because you're looking at areas like uh, data sharing. You're looking at, you know, especially in the ride sharing space, all of you I'm sure are familiar with how uh, Grab has actually uh, acquired uh, Uber in Southeast Asia, DD, Uber in China, and look at how the governments, you know, in each country in Southeast Asia are trying to regulate that space. So it's that constant, you know, um, parallel between do you look at you know, regulating and making sure that there's no monopoly and yet opening up the sector enough to allow the sector to thrive. 
Um, and, and this, is, I think, is a regular you know, debate that is going on uh, these days. Uh, and specifically around data sharing, uh, at least for Mobility X, uh, is extremely important. Um, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with how you know, data is king these days, and it's like the new oil. Um, one good model that I've seen so far is actually the uh, government of, uh, in Finland. So the transport minister actually came from the private sector, fully recognized the power of data, and actually opened up all of the data sets to allow the private sector to thrive. And I think this, besides technology, is actually the next big thing that you need to happen to make sure that businesses actually tap on the data, but yet also respecting um, individual data privacy for that. So it's not easy to be in the government these days, and I think uh, you know, <laughs> something that they have to solve. That's a good point. I, I don't know how unique that is, um, but to, I mean, having there's so much regulation involved and so much need for support from governments for all of this that you need you know, a single point of contact for all things sort of mobility, all things transport, to be able to to have this holistic view of everything, to be able to coordinate, you know, different regulations around bike sharing, cars, around everything, everything else, and it, you know, a little bit like they have in fintech with the chief fintech officer, for example, who is that central <coughs> point of contact for for governments, and so is. Is the transport minister the person who, who is best aligned for that here in Singapore, or should it be somebody else? Do we have the right person here? Do you have a route into government? Is it easy? Are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, far. I, I, yeah, can, I can talk about okay. it. Um, yeah, so I think, that's a, I think regulations is, uh, is a very important piece of any business, especially you know, something that is, that is new. Um, and maybe there isn't an existing framework that neatly fits into it. Um, I, I don't think in any government there is necessarily a you know one single key stakeholder. Um, I think you know in something as commonplace I think as transport, there is many uh, you know stakeholders that need to be involved. Um, you know it, you know it's you know if a bike is uh, is a considered a mode of transport, then it makes sense definitely to work with uh, you know transport ministers, for example. Um, but if it's also parked on a piece of land that is owned by some another you know, part of the government, then I think it's also important to engage with them as well. Um, I think the really important thing here is it's a lot of the onus, I think, is on startups such as OFO to be able to tell the story of you know, why we think OFO is going to be transformative for Singapore, um, why we think OFO is transformative for, for cities, um, why is it important. Um, and you know, if it's just if the story is just that uh, you know companies are dumping bikes everywhere, um, I think that's not a very innovative story for the landscape. But we actually believe that Ofo is much more than that. You know, we see Ofo as a solution for not just first mile solution, bringing people to increase utilization of public transit systems, um, putting more people into MRTs, um, last mile, bringing people from MRTs to uh, office buildings, um, but also just short distance. So if you want to go from your office building to the restaurant. Um, it helps people move around faster. And in fact, one of the biggest cause of congestion um, is people looking for parking. Uh, and when you go from point A to point B in a car and you are circling around looking for parking space um, in your car, uh, that actually causes a lot of congestion. Um, and we're seeing that you know, replacing short distance trips cuts down on uh, those type of trips. Um, it cuts down on car trips, um, reducing congestion, reducing pollution. Um, and I think that you know, it's, it is our responsibility to tell that story to governments. Um, and we're very excited, actually, that a lot of governments, not just Singapore, but you know, around uh, Southeast Asia and Asia, are all you know, very uh, progressively approaching this space. Um, and I think one of your questions earlier related to uh, infrastructure and whether there is enough infrastructure to support innovations like this. Um, actually, one of the very exciting things was last month, uh, I think the Singapore government released a new piece of regulation that said every new building actually needs to have a specific amount of space allocated for bike parking. Um, previously, there was only for cars. Um, and so I think you know, things like this are quite an innovative way of looking at new spaces. Um, and I think there should be a very close collaboration between the private and the, and the public sector to, in order to uh, you know, make sure that these innovations can thrive. You touched on earlier the, uh, the benefits to, um, to, to citizens, to people of all of these solutions. Because often we can just talk about mobility solutions, talk about the solutions itself, rather than how this plays out in people's everyday lives and the benefits they can, it can bring to them. And I like to think about or try and imagine a, a, a world where we have of thinking about autonomous cars, where we have a world with which a city just has autonomous cars and there are much fewer cars on the road. We need less roads, we need 
much, much fewer car, po car park spaces within the city as well. And what could we do to, to, with that extra space that we've just created out of our cities? Could there be urban farming, for example? Let's bring food production closer to the people within urban spaces. I hope it just doesn't turn into more sky rise blocks, but possibly it will. So if we're thinking about that, benefits, how this can make people's lives better. Anybody have a view on this? Michelle, we spoke a little bit earlier about some of the, your interesting ideas about um, how, how your, some of your solutions can help people and make their lives better. Yeah. Um, so I'll answer this in, at two levels because uh, okay. we had a quick conversation on that. At the macro level, all of you would definitely recognize uh, and understand the whole urbanization story. You know, got 6 billion people by 2050 moving to urban areas and that's just 5% of the land track. So quite clearly, you're gonna run into congestion issues, you're gonna run into smog and pollution issues. And what is the problem here then? It's the quality of life. So how do companies like ourselves or technology companies in general flip it over, right? This is a huge pain point. How do you turn that into an opportunity? How do you create solutions like autonomous vehicles or even drones and all that that are emissions free to you know, take people from one place to another and make sure that it's uh, car light or even car free? How do you create uh, mobility as a service solutions to make it easier um, and even fun for people to not drive and to get from one place to another? And what does that serve, right? You have lesser, uh, lesser roads that are required to set aside. And when it comes to a land track, you have a lesser need for car parks. Then um, at a micro level, when it comes to mobility acts, uh, it's a very interesting thing. So uh, while we are going to the B2C space, but we have a lot of uh, estates coming to us recently, not just in Singapore, but in the region. And they say that, look, I'm a developer. Um, I'm, I know the land and I know how to build buildings. But given it's the future of mobility, it's the whole future of smart mobility, can I work with Mobility X to design a future development that looks at you know, incorporating all sorts of new mobility? Why? Because they will want to optimize the economic value of their land. You know, with lesser car parks, lesser roads, increasing the quality of life, the developers win, the tenants win, everybody wins in this space. Anybody want to add anything there? I think there's going to be a change even in the way we work. So. I mean, today we, we still go to the office. Today we 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 live in some people live in suburbs. You know, they, I think there there's going to be the the mobility piece is going to have um, a couple of components, and one component is uh, smart city planning, uh, in terms of better having a better network infrastructure uh, that allows these new mobility. Uh, invention, uh, technologies to enter. But there is another element like, for example, uh, how people collaborate and work together. If, if that reduces the, the, the amount of presence that you need to be in the office, then actually that particular way of planning around it, it will also change the way how the mobility works. It also reduces the transportation. And, and I think this is very important that uh, whether we are doing like train, bicycle, drones. Um, working with city planners is very important because we need to tap on the infrastructure uh, because most of, most of the time, all these things need power. And there is a lot of, um, by the way, today buildings are not allowed to tra transmit power. So it also requires changes in building laws to actually allow you to transmit those power distribution as well. And, and that's what makes this whole space so exciting as, at the same time. <laughs> um. George from Singapore Airlines, did you want to add anything? Um, I, I think the integration of the air, the land, and uh, uh, the sea, and uh, which basically in the end is how do we make people more efficient, whether it's at work, through leisure, and to your early question about you know the uh, who should lead, uh, whether it's the private sector, whether the government sector, I think we should take a quite a market-based approach because if every company who can provide certain services is being a, a, in an open system, being provided open API, then we let whoever make best sense to orchestrate the customer journey to, uh, to make the service work for the customer. And is that probably the best approach? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. The, um, I mean, we've, we've heard about today, but also at other conferences, the proliferation of, of platforms that is at something of, you know, five of the top 10 companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange are all sort of platform companies. We're seeing that in terms of, of finance and social media, in terms of marketing, et cetera, et cetera. We haven't seen a platform emerge from a, a mobility, from a transport point of view. Do we think that will emerge? Do you think this will be turned into a platform play as well? My, my, my view is uh, uh, if, if we take the uh, open API approach, yeah. the platform will emerge uh, by itself. Yeah. 
we believe that there's a platform, particularly in the unmanned traffic management piece, yep. um, because there is different jurisdictions, there's different way of regulating how drone behaves in the airspace, uh, what we call airspace arbitration and management. And I think it's a very exciting time in the drone space because um, the, you have technology companies like Google, like JD.com, they're coming in with their drones and everything. And then at the same time, you have companies like ours who have also been working in the aerospace industry to sort of develop that kind of solution to help them to arbitrate and airspace. So I think it, there will come to a point in time where there will be a platform that enables drones. The question for me would be, what is the regulation space within that from the aviation authorities? How much is it, uh, how free those APIs are going to be allowed for maybe curated users to sort of allow to facilitate services for the users or customers out there? We are just about out of time today. Um, Alan, did you want to add anything? Uh, Final I can word? probably add some few quick thoughts. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think uh, you know for the the platform idea is definitely very interesting. Um, but I think and I think a lot of players want to be that. You know, I yep. think you know with uh, Uber's acquisition of Jump, you know Lyft's potential acquisition of Motivate. Um, there's a lot of you know hype in the space. Um, I think one of the big questions is can the big players keep up with the pace of innovation? The small players can move a lot faster. Um, and that's why you know you see these acquisitions rather than you know uh, build outs themselves. Um, and I think you know if you want to be the platform player, you got to move very fast. Excellent. Final words, Michelle. Yeah, of course. Uh, MobileX as a platform company will certainly want to be that platform company, not just in Singapore but for the region. Um, many people do not recognize this, but you know there's a lot of hype over ride sharing and all that, and how they're trying to go into the platform space. But at least in Singapore, you know there are 12 million trips annually, but ride sharing and taxis just take up one million trips of that. So it's just one of 12 million. And the bulk of the trips actually are from public transportation, shuttle buses, and private cars. So for a platform player like ourselves, with an SMRT parent company that owns a major part of public transportation, to me, it's quite a no-brainer that, you know, yes, there will be an emerging platform player, and it's going to be MobiDX. I think uh, fundamentally, the future is looking very exciting, depending on how it, how it plays out. Lots of really interesting solutions there. For us, I, I, I can't imagine how we're going to be traveling home today from a conference like this in 10 or 20 years' time. What sort of mobility solutions will we have at our hands to be able to do that? Bernard is thinking about one mobility solution because he has to run to the airport immediately. I don't know which one you're <laughs> going to choose today. So I'm taking Scoot. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Excellent. But please join me in thanking our panel for today. It was a great discussion. Thank you.